So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your coffee. It's my pleasure to announce to you Matthew Garrett. Matthew, you work uh, in California for a company that makes a search engine and sells ads and a couple of other things. And for uh, many years, I understand you have been uh, interested and sometime furiated about the Linux boot process. But today, you're here to talk to us about some glimmer of hope on the horizon. So without further ado, Matthew Garrett. Hi. As Martin said, my name is Matthew Garrett. I'm a security developer at Google. I do not work on any user products. I'm also not speaking on behalf of my employers here. Nothing I say here is relevant to, you know, usual stuff. Do not use what I say as the basis of any financial investments. <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about boot security, the security of the boot process. And the reason I'm going to do this is because it's important. And now, obviously, we would like to think that any time any of us is up here talking to you, they should probably think that what they're talking about is important. Otherwise, there's been some sort of terrible series of choices. But the reason that boot security is important is that if you don't have boot security, there is no other security on your system. Every piece of meaningful security on a running computer depends upon the security of the boot process. And the reason for that is that if the boot process is insecure, the boot process can tamper with every further component that is loaded. It can modify your software such that it no longer behaves the way you expect it to. And worse, it can lie to you. You can ask it, did you just tamper with this software? And it will say no, even if previously it was supposed to say yes. So, we need a secure boot process in order to be able to have any worthwhile security at any later level of the operating system. If you don't have boot security, you can't trust your kernel, you can't trust your user land, you can't trust your web browser, your bank details belong to someone else. Is this just a theoretical thing? It's very easy to think about this as you know, just not a meaningful attack strategy. But we've seen in the pre-UFI days, uh, People did write code that lived in the master boot record of, in the boot block of PC hard drives and could then disable various security features inside even modern versions of Windows. And there's no way to protect against that. Once something has the ability to write to your boot block, your boot security is gone, the rest of your security is gone. More advanced ones, instead of directly modifying the boot block may modify the bootloader itself. And this is more relevant on UEFI systems where you don't have a boot block as such. Instead, the firmware looks at a set of variables, a list of bootloaders, and then picks a bootloader and loads that. And we've also seen in the wild some number of attacks that subvert the bootloader. And this is also, this has been seen in the wild on Apple hardware, where the bootloader was replaced. And then when you typed in your disk decryption password, that was stashed and then could be exfiltrated later on. But we've also seen proof of concepts, and maybe not in the wild, of attacks that don't attack the bootloader itself, but go one layer further, which is um, the initRD, the component in Linux systems that is responsible for the early Linux side of the boot process. The initRD is a RAM disk that contains various bits and pieces of interesting stuff, such as, say, uh, something's put a pretty picture on the screen to distract you from the fact that computers are terrible, but also contains the code that does stuff like decrypt your hard drive, because you can't do that with code that's on the hard drive because it's encrypted. So the InnisRD is responsible for taking user input or obtaining the decryption secret from some other source and then passing that to the kernel, mounting your root file system, and then executing the rest of it. We've seen cases where people have modified the initRD such that when you type in your passphrase, again, your passphrase is stashed somewhere and can be exfiltrated later. And to you, it looks like a completely normal boot process. So we're left with the question, of, well, how do we fix these? Because this would be kind of depressing if I stopped there. 
there is a variety of solutions that are used on a variety of platforms. Uh, the embedded world is uh, a fascinating place in this respect. But I'm going to focus primarily on PC type systems. And in, for those, the only solution that we currently have is UEFI Secure Boot. Uh, this was a part of the UEFI specification added around 2010, 2011. But it became notable to the Linux community when Microsoft required that it be present and enabled in all machines shipped in uh, mid-2012 onwards if they were certified to run Windows 8. And the initial concern was that these systems would not be able to run anything other than Windows. And the reason for that is that UEFI Secure Boot depends on the bootloader being signed. Now, in the UEFI world, executables such as your bootloader are PE files. They're the same file format as is used by executables on Windows. And it just so happens that Microsoft already had a signing format for Windows executables. So coincidentally, the UEFI signing format is exactly the same as the one used for Windows, which is wonderful because it's not actually precisely specified and you can come up with incompatible implementations that are still spec compliant. Software's hard. Writing specifications is even harder. Anyway, so you have a signature. The firmware has a list of certificates that it trusts. And if an object has an appropriate signature, and if the executable has not been tampered with, then you will boot that object. You can boot that object. If it's either signed with an untrusted key, if it's not signed, or if the signature has been cut and pasted from another file and no longer matches the file it's attached to, you attempt to execute it, and you just get an error telling you that you can't do that. So this sounds great. The boot security problem is then solved. We're able to stop now, and it is in, uh, as of now, it is 150 seconds until happy hour starts at the gin bar across the road. Unfortunately, the problem is not actually solved, which is why I'm here telling you that things are bad, but I have a plan, as opposed to telling you that they're fixed. So yeah, obviously, the problem is not entirely solved, because going back to one of the attack vectors I mentioned earlier, Init RDs are not signed. They're not PE objects. They're not executable. UEFI Secure Boot knows nothing about them. From a UEFI spec perspective, they're merely an implementation detail of the bootloader. They are things the bootloader handles outside the spec. So the bootloader could deal with signatures on them. But why? And obviously, as I mentioned, Init RDs do a bunch of meaningful security stuff. But we can't easily just sign them because they contain local configuration. They're built typically on the local system. Users do things like choose which artwork they want to display because users have opinions. And so we can't easily say, OK, the init RD is going to be built by your distribution, and then we're going to put a signature on it, and then we're going to have a bootloader that is able to both verify UEFI style signatures and is also able to verify arbitrary detached signatures for init RDs. We could all do all that. And then we're into, well, now we're on at least three layers of crypto and we're having a bad time. So we can circumvent all of this in theory and just step onto, well, uh, how about we use a completely orthogonal piece of security technology in the form of a Trusted Platform Module, or TPM. TPMs are small cryptographic devices that sit on your system motherboards. They are very slow. They are relatively inexpensive. And they're not particularly good at anything that you would normally want to do. When you say, oh, I have a hardware crypto device on my motherboards, you think, excellent. I can run my crypto on there, and it will be faster. And it will not be faster. The reason TPMs are interesting, though, is that they don't, they're not under the control of the system processor. They can hold secrets. They can contain information. 
and they can make decisions based on that information. And your CPU can't directly interfere with them. They're independent devices with a very well-defined communications framework. One of the features of a TPM is a set of registers called platform configuration registers. And these registers just contain hash values. You pass a hash value to the TPM, and it incorporates that hash value into the value that's in a PCR, generates a new hash, and then stores that. Whenever you reset your system, all the PCRs are zero. As you boot, each component of your boot process hashes the next component and passes that to the TPM. So the TPM contains basically a list of cryptographic hashes that describes your boot process. And this is called measurement. You are measuring each component in turn. The TPM has copies of these measurements. Now, in itself, that doesn't seem particularly helpful. The TPM, as I mentioned, is an independent device. The TPM cannot prevent your system from booting. On a system with a TPM, you can still boot whatever you want to. But the measurements that go into the TPM as a result will be different. Remember what I said, the TPM can make decisions about what to do based on various things. One thing a TPM can do is decide whether or not to release secrets based on the PCR values. So you have a PCR that contains measurements of the firmware. You have a PCR that contains measurements of the drivers for any plug-in devices. You have a PCR that contains measurements of the bootloader. You have a uh, PCR that potentially contains a measurement of the init RD. And if all those values are correct, the TPM can decide to release a secret. So great, we have the bootloader measure the init RD, and then we put the disk decryption key into the TPM. And then when you boot, if the PCR values match, the TPM hands over the secrets to the operating system, your disk gets unlocked, you don't even have to type your password, and your system boots in a completely secure way. If anybody tampers with your init RD, the measurements change, and the TPM refuses to hand over the secret, your disk doesn't get unlocked, everyone is a winner. Up until the point where, through a unfortunate confluence of decisions, you lose all your data, because if any of those values change, if any of those PCRs change, the TPM stops handing that secret over. If you do a firmware update, the firmware values change. If you update your bootloader, the bootloader value changes. If you rebuild your initRD, the initRD value changes. And if in any of those cases, you fail to update the PCR, the acceptable PCR values in the TPM, the TPM will no longer hand your secret over. And getting back into a recovery state may be impossible. So relying on fully measured, as in measuring every single component of the boot process, is really, really hard. Fortunately, Microsoft saved us. So uh, thank you, Microsoft. That was very helpful. Uh, we appreciate that a great deal. Microsoft realized that this fragility was a problem, presumably because people turned this functionality on in Windows and then kept phoning Microsoft to ask how to get their data back. Because while it's difficult for us, it turns out it's also difficult for Microsoft. And Microsoft thought about this hard, and Microsoft does employ a large number of smart people. And Microsoft decided that, well, the easiest way to handle this was to take advantage of the fact that currently Secure Boot and Trusted Boot, this TPM-based thing, were completely orthogonal and unrelated, and instead tie the two of them into each other. Make a measurement process that takes advantage of the properties of Secure Boot. Remember, in Secure Boot, the only code that will be booted is stuff that's signed. But you also want some degree of guarantee that someone has not tampered with various other bits of the boot process such that they're able to circumvent the security guarantees of the science material. So in this mode, 
rather than measuring the files, you measure the signing keys that were used in the boot process. And think about it. If you signed something yourself, you know that an attacker can't tamper with it. You know that the TPM measurement, if the PCR value is correct, then that means it was signed with your signing key. As long as your signing key is under your control, then the TPM is in a good state. The boot process is in a good state. It booted something that you signed, therefore everything's OK. The actual content could be anything. You signed it. So as long as you signed it, or as long as someone you trust, like your distribution signed it, you're fine. But NSRDs aren't signed. So we haven't actually solved much here as yet. If you still incorporate the measurement of the NSRD, everything still breaks whenever the NSRD gets rebuilt. And on Debian, that's something that happens because it's a day, as far as I can tell. You install a package, your NSRD gets rebuilt. It's, I installed LibreOffice. Why is my NSRD getting rebuilt? And it's, yeah, some components got upgraded, and it's a component that goes into the NSRD, and therefore it's been rebuilt as well. Wonderful. This makes things difficult. So how can we apply this to NSRDs while still allowing user configuration, which is apparently important because Linux is about choice? More of you should have laughed at that. <laughs> System D, uh, since it includes literally every piece of software anybody could ever conceive ever, <laughs> includes something to solve this problem. System D includes something called the System D boot stub. Um, the System D boot stub is not the same as the System D boot loader, even though some of the codes are shared, and even though it is quite understandable that you might think they're the same thing, they are not the same thing. The System D boot stub is a very small EFI executable. You build it, and if you run it, it then does nothing or crashes. So that's a good start. But you use objcopy to embed a kernel and an NSRD into this. And then when you run it, it relocates the kernel and the NSRD and then jumps into the kernel. So you have a single image. And then you can sign that. And that single signed image contains both your kernel and your NSRD. And more than that, it can also contain the kernel command line. So you can embed a lot of stuff in there under a single signature, and then you just, it's a valid EFI object. So you can run that from anything that is able to run a standard EFI object, which includes other bootloaders, which includes the UEFI shell. Uh, you can point the firmware directly at this, and you don't need an additional bootloader at all. The firmware will just jump directly to this, verify the signature, and then run the kernel and in its RD with that command line. But in its RDs contain local information. And we can't expect average end users to sign their own stuff all the time. End users are not security experts, it transpires. Years of practice have taught me that end users are not fundamentally good at cryptography. And I do not blame end users for this. I should emphasize that. Uh, we have made a very complicated set of things and then asked end users who really would prefer that computers mostly just go away entirely, that if they don't understand this stuff, it's their fault. And that's a terrible thing to tell users. And it's our fault. We should do better. We can't ask users to sign their own stuff. So we need another solution. Thankfully, I say thankfully a lot. Uh, I have a lot to be thankful for. Thankfully, you can pass multiple NSRD images to the kernel. 
Uh, and InitRD is just a compressed CPIO archive. Um, CPIO, I don't even know what CPIO expands to. It's something from the past. <laughs> it predates me. Yeah, um, Keith points out that CPIO existed before I was born, and I believe that to be true. CPIO will probably be there after I die. It will probably be there after we all die. CPIO will outlive all of us. <laughs> be careful when you're inventing file formats. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and the nice thing about CPIO is that it's a very simple format. And so you just create a CPIO archive. And then if you just smash it onto the end of another CPIO, CPIO archive, the kernel is actually able to just work through one and then work through the other and unpack each of them in turn. So this takes the form of the kernel mounts a magical rootfs RAM disk, and then decompresses and extracts each initRD image in turn into that. The nice thing here is that each of them will overwrite the previous one. So the goal here is to make it possible to have a user-controlled initRD that is not signed but to still have a trustworthy boot process. The trick is that if we design our initRDs such that configuration and code can be cleanly separated, we can unpack an initRD that contains the configuration first, and we can unpack another initRD that contains the code afterwards and on top. And if an attacker attempts to put code in the configuration in its RD, the kernel will just overwrite it with the contents of the code in its RD. So if we embed the code in its RD in the signed image, we can then provide an additional data configuration in its RD and not have to worry about any security implications. And I say this, um, this is obviously a lie. Right now, this is not how the world works. One of the ways in which the world doesn't work like this is that people think, oh, configuration. And the way we do configuration is that we set environment variables in bash, and then we'll just import that file that contains those environment variables. And it's, yeah, you're not actually, that, that's not data anymore, that's code. Your configuration format is code. This is bad. So first of all, we need to just fix the entire world to stop importing. <sighs> yeah, anyway. So it turns out that um, with not too much work, this is viable. And not too much work may involve completely replacing the way that Debian generates in its RDs again, which is, I think, at least the third time it was happened in the time I've been using Debian. Uh, but then I've been using Debian 20 years almost, so that's not too bad. I hear that Debian users really enjoy change. <laughs> but anyway, let's assume that we can solve that, because it's code. It, this is a simple technical problem, and simple technical problems are easy to solve, especially in Debian. But the kernel command line is also security sensitive, because it seems like nobody can ever think of a good security feature that someone won't want to turn off. And the kernel command line lets you turn security features off. So um, for instance, mm, the IOMMU exists in part to prevent someone plugging a DMA-capable device into your machine and then just extracting all the secrets from it. Uh, so your disk decryption key is stored by the TPM, but is copied into RAM to actually work while the system's running, because the TPM's not fast enough to decrypt your hard drive in real time. The system processor has to do that. You can turn the IOMU off from the command, kernel command line, and that means that someone can then boot your system with the IOMU disabled, and then dump your disk decryption key, and then steal your drive and get all your data, even if they don't know your passwords. So again, Kind of bad. But thankfully, again, the kernel saves us once more, because if you have the same parameter on the kernel command line multiple times, the last one wins. Usually, it's possible for people to break this presumption, because this isn't actually specified. 
software, again, is hard. Um, but we can have a command line that is inside the signed image that turns on all the relevant security features. And then we can append that to whatever command line the user provides. And we need to do a bit of additional filtering because if the user types in a command line that has space dash dash space, then the kernel will stop interpreting anything after that as part of its command line and will instead pass that in it. All I'm saying is that if we can invent a time machine, maybe we should do some things differently. But what's the point of all of this? What is the point of having a mechanism in which we get to a state where the TPM has a meaningful measurement of stuff we booted without being too fragile? What is the additional security that we get? And there's a bunch of things like, as I mentioned, the disk encryption keys can be stored there. But you can also get proof of device state. And I wrote a piece of software called TPM TOTP, which it's like a TOTP two-factor authentication setup, except instead of you proving yourself to a remote system by typing a number from your device into the remote system, your laptop boots. If it's in a valid state, it can then get a seed from the TPM, which the TPM will not otherwise give it. And it can then, based on the current time, show you a six-digit number. And you can then compare that to your phone, see if the numbers are the same. And if so, you know the system is in a secure state, and you know that you can type your passwords into it, rather than your passwords being typed into a keylogger. Something I've been thinking about this week by virtue of having been given one of the uh, Tomu USB uh, microcontroller things is you could do the same thing. But instead of having the six-digit number, you could have a conversation between the Tomu and your laptop on boot. So the TPM will hand a hand proof of its state over to the Tomu, and then the Tomu can blink an LED if it verifies that you booted in a secure state. So you can see the blinking light, and you can know that it's safe to type your password in. So we have the ability to prove that your device is in a trustworthy state before you tell the system anything. We can do remote attestation, which is, in one sense, a way to brutally restrict what users are able to do with their systems for the benefit of corrupt, massively unethical capitalist organizations. Or alternatively, is a great way for you to know that the machine that is trying to connect to your network is a machine that should be trying to connect to your network and is not, say, a tool of an unethical, massively corrupt capitalist entity. Uh, so, hey, it's technology. We can use it for good or evil. Remote attestation, you prove your device state to a remote site, and the remote site makes a decision based on that. And that can be useful for a variety of circumstances. Say, in a cloud setup, the compute nodes can prove to the controller that they booted the correct operating system that they were not tampered with. And you can look at that and make a decision as to whether or not you're happy to pass user jobs to those systems, or whether you think this system's now in an untrustworthy state. And you can securely provision secrets to remote systems. Uh, one of the problems you have if you want to get stuff systems set up in the data center is how do you get your secrets onto those systems? Now, the usual way is you send someone out there with a USB stick that contains the secrets. And once the machine's installed, they provision the secrets. That means you need to pay for a someone to go and sit in a data center waiting for machines to install. And that isn't fun for anybody. You can put the secrets on the machines in your location, and then you can send the machines out to the data center. And then anyone who intercepts them in the way, on the way is able to extract your secrets. Or you can just YOLO it. and rack it in the data center, and then when the machine comes up, assume that it was provisioned to your instructions and not to someone else's instructions, and then copy your secrets to it and assume that they're secure. Instead, you can get the machine, 
you can record the TPM information, or you can potentially even get your vendor to provide you with the TPM identity in advance. You can ship that system off to the data center, get it installed, and then it can attest back to you, hi, I'm this system, I'm now running this software, and can I please have some secrets? And you can cryptographically verify that, and then you can encrypt the secrets with a key that is associated with the TPM on that device. And then it's impossible for any other device to decrypt those secrets. Only the machine that you are sending those secrets to will be able to decrypt them. So you can securely provision systems without having to have any trusted people touch the machine. So I've told you about some code I've written. Um, I'm going to demo it because I'm a fool. Uh, QMU. All right, QMU. Uh, yes. Thank you, Wayland. Those of you who have not seen the UEFI shell before will understand that uh, it looks kind of like DOS. It looks really like DOS. It behaves really like, it's got backslashes in path names. And, and yeah, CD doesn't behave the way you expect it to. And it does duh rather than LS. Although LS works as well, because why not? Anyway, um, so I have here boot.efi. As you can see, it is 22 megabytes big, which is quite a large executable. The reason it's large is that it contains a kernel and an NSRD and a command line stub. So I'm going to do boot.efi, and I'm going to do root equals dev sda, uh, sorry, b2, and then uh, I'm going to, ah, I'm going to circumvent security by doing init equals bin bash. And for good measure, I'm going to um, disable the IO MMU. And also, I'm going to load, I'm going to load an init RD that in this case actually doesn't contain anything evil, but could contain something evil. So let's see what happens. That's good. And oh, it didn't run bash. In fact, it boosted entirely. So what's in the command line? Hmm. Uh, so we see that it has removed the init equals bin bash from there. And it's also appended Intel IOMU equals on so that the system boots with the IOMMU enabled. So uh, yeah, my, all my attempts to circumvent the boot process security there were just disabled and the system booted into a secure state. So good, my demo works, thankfully. So while I'm at this, I'm also going to quickly um, uh, bother. No, no. Right there. Uh, so I'm currently in on this window. Is this large enough for people to read? Yeah, at the back there. Any wave your arms in the air if it's bad. Okay. Better. Okay, you're happy. I like people being happy. So here I am in slash sys slash kernel slash security slash TPM zero, which is one of my favorite kernel directories. Uh, it contains these files. And these are copies of the log that is kept by the TPM during the boot process. These contain everything that the TPM measures during boot. And the binary one is the interesting one. And it's in binary, so it's not actually very readable. So I'm going to pipe it through hex dump. And we can see, OK, there's, um, I really like seeing the word debug there. That's concerning. Uh, so boot guard is an Intel technology where the management engine, which is secure, <laughs> I've been asked to stop saying mean things about the management engine. So I'm not going to. The management engine measures the first chunk of the system firmware into the TPM and then optionally verifies a signature on it. So if anyone tampers with the system firmware, either the system doesn't boot at all 
or the uh, measurement changes. So if you're based on, if you're basing your secret policy, your TPM policy on the firmware PCR values as well as the boot PCR values, then BootGuard makes this more reliable. It, because BootGuard does this before the CPU starts executing any of this code. Further down, we've got various bits of configuration. And then here, uh, we have measurements of the secure boot policy. And you can see, you can tell because it says secure boot. And then here, we have, uh, it is measuring the secure boot key database. So as we scroll through here, you'll see a bunch of keys belonging to my system vendor and to Microsoft. Uh, and well, yep, all of this looks kind of like an RSA key, an RSA certificate. And it's, you'll see the Microsoft one appear multiple times because firstly, it's there as this is the copy that's in the firmware, but then also this is the copy that was used to verify the signature on my bootloader. And then we have a whole bunch of other, yep, there we go. I think this is the one that is used to, um, this one is, you don't need to care. Like, this is just for local color. And then it booted um, my bootloader. So there we go. And if I go back over here, uh, right. And here are some GitHub repos that contain various bits of relevant code. Now, one thing, the systemd boot stub, as I mentioned, is not a bootloader in the traditional sense. It's just a way of executing a kernel. You still potentially want a bootloader for UI purposes and to give the user a way to do things like edit the command line. Uh, Grub is still the most fully featured one of those on x86. The verifier TPM module adds full measurement support to Grub. So Grub will then not only, the system firmware will measure the system D boot stub, but Grub will also measure that into other PCRs and can also measure other bits of boot configuration. So if you want a more complex policy, if you are willing to deal with the fragility yourself, you can use this and you can have a much more interesting fine grained policy. And then the system, the um, support for multiple INTRDs and command line appending is in that repo. I've not tried to push those upstream yet. And then TPM TOTP is the tool I, measure, I mentioned previously for letting you verify system boot state by verifying that the six digits your computer gives you are the same as the six digits that your phone is giving you. So we have seven minutes left. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Matthew. I have a, a socket in my motherboard for a TPM, but yes. whenever I go to look for something to put in it, everything looks incredibly shady and not yes. something that I'd really like to buy for it's that It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Can you recommend? No. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. So the way I solve these problems is that I get a reputation for supporting TPMs on Linux because I've made some, among the terrible life choices I've made, and then TPM vendors just send these things to me. And then, uh, I, so I have a supply of TPMs from all kinds of interesting places. Like I've got Chinese TPMs. Uh, TPM2 is wonderful because it supports using different hash algorithms. So you have TPMs that do SHA, and you have TPMs that do the Chinese equivalent of SHA, and you have TPMs that do the Russian equivalent of SHA. So you can pick which country you think is least likely to have a, both a backdoored cryptographic hash algorithm and want you to have a bad day. And you can get one of those TPMs. But, so the pinout of TPMs is standardized. The socket that you plug them into is less well standardized. There's basically a large 20 pin header that's just two rows of 10 that's about, um, this is not really helpful for anyone, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's uh, a couple of inches long. Oops. I've been in America too long, about four centimeters, five centimeters long. 
And then there's a much smaller one. You can get adapter boards that convert between them. And occasionally, you can find TPMs on these boards on Amazon. I don't know if that helps you in Australia. Probably not. It'll arrive here in 15 years or something. Uh, <laughs> so no, I don't have good recommendations, I'm afraid. Sorry. But try Amazon. Thank you very much for your talk, Matthew. Cloud vendors and lining up to do these sorts of things with their environments, um, is there anything that's really working there yet? And what suggestions or what things could they do to get us to that point? Uh, vendors as in distributions? Or? More like if I was putting something up on AWS and I want to make sure oh, the right. hardware yeah. underlying and the, the hypervisor, etc. is yeah. something that I can trust. So Azure has uh, support for secure boot and also does TPM support. So I believe you can set something like this up on Azure. I cannot comment on uh, other cloud providers. Anymore? There's a question yep. here. Yeah, how, how do you compare with the, the circuit boot uh, kind of status on a desktop and compare with the one currently having and I think already supported and enjoyed like UEFI circuit boots? Oh, so yeah, the Android verified boot process is quite different. Um, yeah. Initial ID uh, cannot change because it's fixed. Uh, that's one of the problems. Yeah, with so on. Certainly on Nexus, recent Nexus and Pixel devices, and uh, potentially on other unlockable devices, you can change the trusted signing key. Uh, but right now, I honestly don't know whether you can do the sort of combination of the verified boot and a trusted boot thing. I believe that aspects of safety net on Android are to an extent, something similar to remote attestation, but I don't know the details myself. Um, I'm not on the Android team. Okay, and maybe another question is, uh, why the Android didn't use the TPM instead of using the others like TrustZone? So what's your view on this one? Uh, I mean, this is complicated. I, again, I can't speak for the Android team, not on the Android team. Um, the embedded world in general has not tended to use TPMs because you have some level of crypto functionality on the SOC, and adding an additional TPM would be additional cost. Uh, I think the, in terms of implementing a spec compliance TPM, the only ARM devices I've seen that do that were Windows Phone, uh, Windows CE devices, where they were booting, um, not Windows CE, uh, Windows RT, uh, which used a TPM for the secret management, but even though those were ARM, they basically looked like PCs for this purpose. So outside that, I, it's just not the thing the embedded world seems to do. Maybe quickly to fill in, Matthew, I have a very short question. When sure. you said that the computer itself is going to pop up a six-digit number, and then I can verify the integrity of the device. Um, what you've shown earlier about the, in it, the, the kernel command line being reverted to a secure state, mm -hmm. Does, is that what ensures that I can't just write malware that pops up a six-digit number to make you believe that a... Uh, well, it could pop up a six-digit number easily, it but won't be the right it one. would be a different six-digit number. Thank you. Um, I first, I looked into TPMs back in oh, 2010, 2012, something mm -hmm. like that, and I'm I developed sorry. the reflexive association that they are user hostile, freedom hostile potentially, and to run screaming. Has that improved? Nobody has as yet deploys TPMs in a user hostile way, for the most part. Uh, it turns out that it's very difficult to build a real remote attestation chain that gives you certainty that the user is not running uh, tampered software that's going to circumvent whatever you're trying to do. And in the face of, okay, so the easiest way to get around remote attestation. Boot your system. The TPM on your motherboard now has uh, values that record the fact that you booted a hacked copy of an operating system that will gladly say, I implement DRM, and will then dump the contents of everything to disk anyway. So at that point, the remote site says, no, you can't speak to me. Get another TPM from, say, Amazon, who I believe may sell them. Plug that into you, and then just hook that off 
your parallel ports or something. Just build a USB adapter for it, and then program good values into that TPM. And then when the remote attestation query comes in, direct it to the one that you programmed instead of the one on your motherboard. And you don't need, if the idea is to stop people dumping stuff, then if that's the security model, you've just got a way to completely circumvent that. Given that this is possible, it's not usually being used for DRM. It's more being used for cases where you want to verify that the machine has not been compromised without the user's knowledge. So it's cases where my laptop has not been compromised while I'm trying to get onto my company's VPN, for instance. If I'm deliberately trying to circumvent my employer's access controls, yeah, I can do that. So I think we're out of time. Matthew, yeah, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for your enticing and hope-inspiring talk. Thank you.